Yeah, my name is Leland Rucker, and uh, I'm senior editor of Senzi Magazine, and I'm here uh, to record a segment for tomorrow, for Thanksgiving Day, for my uh, marijuana five-minute segment on Marijuana News. Basically, it first got started, I was writing a column for the Boulder Weekly called Weed Between the Lines, and uh, I don't know whether they, whether KGNU approached me or whether I approached them. I've uh, been a volunteer at the station for many years, and uh, but Maeve and I decided that we would uh, just do a five-minute segment as part of their Thursday morning news. Um, so uh, we came up with the idea of just talking about what's going on in the marijuana world, and there's never a problem with that. <laughs> there's, there's always something going on in the marijuana world. Leland Rucker is a senior editor at Sensi Magazine, and he joins us on KGNU on Thursday mornings to talk about the latest news in cannabis. And today, in honour of the day that's in it, Leland, you're sharing what you're thankful for. Yeah, you know, this is uh, coming up January 1st. There, We will have five full years of uh, being able to uh, buy legal cannabis. I think the first off, uh, one of the things that I'm thankful for is the fact that I can buy cannabis if I want to. Uh, it's something I enjoyed before it was legal, and uh, today I like going to dispensaries. I like talking to people in the dispensaries, and uh, I don't have to look at that little bag and say, gee, that's only gonna, that's got to last me for another seven days, you know. Um, no more seeds and stems, no, no more seeds. Uh, I'm very thankful for that, um, and I'm really thankful uh, that I know that what I'm buying is what it says on the label for the most part, uh, not not just a used baggie of something, some product. Uh, I don't know exactly what it was some, some, sometimes, but, you know, Colorado cannabis is uh, amongst the best in the world. There's even reports now that our product is being exported across the border to Mexico. It's just the opposite of what it used to be. Um, I'm thankful that I don't have to meet a friend of a friend in some alley or somewhere where I don't even know who the person is and having to buy it. I'm thankful that the taxes that we pay go to support good things. Just recently, um, there's a story that uh, Colorado has been a leader in bullying protection uh, for high school students. Um, and in 2015, voters approved Proposition BB, which uses marijuana tax funds to uh, to uh, give them the money for that. And that's such a great thing. I mean, these are just some of the things we're paying taxes for. Um, construction for outdated rural schools, for dropout prevention programs, improving housing, uh, giving kids scholarships. It's just amazing what's going on with that money. And just outside of, you know, a lot of the recreational cannabis now that that's been legalized, I have certainly spoken to a lot of people who don't necessarily consume any form of cannabis, but they're incredibly thankful for the fact that they can now research it and that some of the restrictions that certainly were limiting public universities because of the federal prohibition on cannabis, we're seeing some of that loosen. And certainly within Colorado, there's a lot more research being done. And regardless of how you feel about cannabis, I think that is a positive move that we can actually have some science behind, particularly the medicinal uh, marijuana industry. That's one of the things that I'm really thankful for, too, is that here in Colorado, um, even people who were against marijuana at the beginning, and let's face it, almost 99% of the legislature was against it at the beginning, are now behind it and now are supporting that kind of research. Tax monies are going for research. Uh, right here in, in Boulder at CU, you know, there's things going on. Um, and I think that that's something that we all have to be thankful for. And the the main thing is, is that we passed Amendment 664. We defied the world. We actually said, you know, we're going to we're going to go ahead and do this, even though everybody says it's wrong and that there's going to be awful things happen. But awful things haven't happened. You know, basically, the, the only difference is that now people aren't going out in the into the black market as much as they used to. Some people still are. But I think it's something that we can all be thankful for and just stop and think about what it was like before. Also, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the legislature this year. I think with the changeover you know, to a Democratic legislature and with a governor who's been supportive of marijuana for now in the, uh, in the U.S. House, uh, this is this is liable to change things. Some of the things that Governor Hickenlooper uh, was against and who vetoed, like the P PTSD for uh, for medical patients and stuff like that, these are things that I think are going to 
at least have a chance of happening now. And maybe we might see banking for the uh, cannabis industry as well. I know that's been a, a major issue. right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, we shall see. But in the meantime, thank you and happy Thanksgiving, Leland. Same to you, Maeve. Leland Rucker is a senior editor at Sensi Magazine. You can read more of his work online at sensimag.com and catch him Thursday mornings right here on KGMU. Kind of interesting. Uh, at this time yesterday, I had no idea what I was going to do for the show. Uh, sometimes it just pops up. Um, I follow a lot of different websites. I, f- I follow as much as I can on what's happening in the marijuana world. And some, you know, every now and then I just glom onto something that I think is interesting. This particular episode was just a Thanksgiving episode, uh, just trying to be thankful for the fact that we have legal uh, cannabis in Colorado and how thankful I am for that. Uh, it has been a good thing as far as I'm concerned. We're, we're coming up on five years. January 1st will be five years that we've had, that you've been able to go to a store and buy cannabis. Uh, a lot of the things that people have said were going to be awful, that were going to be terrible, uh, kid, more kids were going to use it. Um, None of this has really happened. Uh, All of the studies that we've done, at least so far, and there's no definitive evidence, you know, we're still a long way away from that, but at least all the evidence so far says that none of those bad things are happening and that the only real difference is that people are buying marijuana in stores instead of on the black market. That's really the main difference. On a professional level, um, I was working at a, at a uh, television station and I, you know, the job was fine, but it wasn't really something I wanted to do. And then I was doing this, I started doing this column, Weed Between the Lines for the Boulder Weekly. And this was really interesting to me. It was like a way to get back to writing again, to be in a journalist again, the way I used to be. And it was such a fascinating subject. So there was always something to write about. There was always something to learn. And so basically it's just been a process of doing that. Um, When Ron Kolb, the, uh, um, the head of Senzi Magazine, he came to Colorado, he read my column, he got a hold of me and said, I'd like to pick your brain, but I think it might be good for both of us. And that's one of the first times I'd, I'd ever been asked to do a job because somebody had read what I was doing. That's not always the case in journalism. Um, but in this case, it, it was. And the opportunity to write about cannabis for adults and trying to break the stigma of a hundred years of the, the bullshit that we've been fed is, has really been a great experience. It's just been so fascinating that here around the world, since Colorado legalized, Colorado you know, Colorado was an hour ahead of Washington in, in legalization, but here we defied the world and there's so many things going on around the world, here in the States, uh, below us in Mexico, now they're starting to think about it. Canada has just legalized. There's so much going on in the last five years And I just got back from the MJ BizCon in Las Vegas, and to imagine that this is going to stop at this point in time is just insane. There is way too much money going on. Right now, business is behind it, legislatures are for the most part behind it, and consumers are are behind it. Once you get that, everything's going to continue to happen. You know, for 35, 40 years, I bought pot. Pot. Was it a bag? I didn't get to choose what it was. I pretty much took whatever whatever it was, like millions of other people. And so I'm not the connoisseur that somebody who's younger is. Definite, definitely. I mean, uh, but the fact that we have all of these different kinds, these different strains, uh, where you know, it's not. It's not the truth that we didn't have strains back then. There was always, I could always occasionally get Colombian. It would cost me three times as much as the Mexican. Or I could get uh, Panama Red or uh, Acapulco Gold or something like that. Um, But the fact that now farmers and people who grow marijuana are actually have the opportunity to grow good marijuana. Now, people always say, gee, it's stronger, it's, it's more dangerous because it's stronger. No, it's just better. 
It's just better. It doesn't mean that people are smoking more of it because it's stronger. Maybe somebody does, maybe somebody doesn't, but it's just better. There was a movement here a couple of years ago in, in, in Colorado to limit the amount of THC, the percentage of THC. So in, in effect, you'd be telling farmers and growers, don't grow your best product, just grow mediocre product. I just think the whole thing is silly. I think it's just, you know, it's just another plot from somebody who doesn't like cannabis to have another reason to say it's all bad for us. And it isn't. It isn't. I just gravitate towards whatever, I, whenever I go to a store, I'm always just asking, you know, what's the best you have right now? You know, what's the, what's kind of the, the top strain, just to kind of, you know, keep in touch. The fact is we don't get any bad <laughs> cannabis for five years now. I've only gotten, maybe mediocre would be, but that's about it. I mean, it's always so much better than it ever was. And that's the thing that I'm so grateful for. <laughs> I'm the senior editor of uh, Sen Senzi. Basically, Senzi is, is a lifestyle magazine with a cannabis emphasis. It's basically about people who use cannabis as part of their lives. And that's kind of most of us, you know. And so that's the idea behind the magazine. I was, I've been given the opportunity to write a lot of news stories about what's going on. As we've uh, expanded into other states, we started here in Colorado. Now we have three magazines in California, we have a magazine in Las Vegas, and we have a magazine in Boston. And as we've done that, I've been able to cover a lot of different kinds of stories. Uh, I just did one recently, for instance, on uh, the, uh, the beer industry, which seems to be having an interest in the cannabis industry. I talked with uh, Keith Villa. He's creating a beer with alcohol, then extracting all the alcohol out of it, and then putting cannabinoids back in so that you get what he calls the same kind of experience that you're going to get from a light beer, for instance. Now, I don't know if he can do that. We'll find out because I understand those, that those things are just going on to the market. I also talked to a gentleman out in California who wanted to find pure hops, and you can't find feral hops in the United States because all hops are controlled by beer companies. <laughs> so he had to go uh, over to Asia and he spent months over there looking, trying to get feral hops and he was, you know, collecting feral hops plants. He found hops plants that had THC and CBD in them. The THC plants he wasn't int interested in, but he was interested enough in the CBD plants that now he has a product on the market of CBD created from a, from a bud, from, not, from a, not from a marijuana plant, but from a hops plant. And that, I've never heard of that before. Maybe we'll hear some more about it. I don't know. We'll find out. Maybe there's more feral hops out there. Uh, they're similar plants. They're all in the, in the same category. So, but, uh, but those are the kind of stories that I'm really interested in. And right now I'm working on a story for the January issue about the, uh, the problem with expungement of criminal records for people who have small marijuana offenses on their record. Uh, sometimes that can really destroy people's lives. It's something that here all of us can do legally and other people are still in jail or they still have that on their record. So I'm kind of looking into that because I think it's something that we need to be thinking about. The way we have it set up, um, I mean, we have a capitalist system and the way that we have it set up, um, it's almost inevitable that big business is going to get involved and uh, in some way or other and eventually probably take over the business. Um, I think that there will definitely be uh, opportunities for crafts, you know, kind of craft cannabis, like there are craft beers and stuff like that. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity, but definitely things will change. I'm kind of seeing that happen right now. Another thing that it depends on is what the government decides to do with it. If it schedules it as, as a Schedule II drug instead of a Schedule I where it is now, that'll give pharmaceutical companies the edge 
to make drugs because they're the ones that can spend $2 billion to create a new drug, whereas smaller pe people can't. So there's that possibility. But Colorado, for the most part, because of its residency requirements, has been able to keep all of big, big business from all around the country from happening. There's a lot of pushback on that from a lot of people who say that that's stymieing a lot of growth that the, that the state could, stymieing the growth that, the, that, that could happen here in the state. But we'll have to see about that. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm wary. I'm wary. I think the probably the biggest problem is going to be distribution. Uh, right now, if we're going to use that analogy, toilet paper is distributed in a certain way all around the world. And in order for a company to break in and to have hemp toilet paper, they're going to have to break into that distribution network and become part of that or they're not going to be very successful. That's kind of a... That's kind of part of the tough part of it. Uh, the other part is just marketing. It's just pure marketing. If people understand the possibilities that hemp has, and I'll be honest, I think that the possibilities have been overblown by some people. I, I mean, I don't think hemp is the absolute savior of the earth or anything like that, but I think it's something that, you know, for a, basically 100 years ago in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago in the 1930s, the United States said, um, we're just going to give up hemp production, uh, industrial hemp production, because it looks like marijuana. The um, rest of the world, you can uh, take over. That's basically what we did, just because it looked like marijuana. So it's going to take time yet, but with people like Mitch McConnell and states like Kentucky going, Colorado grew more hemp than any other state in the Union, and it's a high desert? What's wrong with this picture? People in North Carolina, farmers that used to grow tobacco, they're dying to do this. I've talked with people about this. They're dying to do this. So it's not going to take too much longer. I think this next farm bill is going to be one that's going to be pushed by Republicans. And I think a lot of the bills that are out there in the House right now, since the Democrats have taken over, they're going to get out of the Rules Committee and they're going to get out in the House. And we're going to start seeing a lot of changes. I've talked about this a lot. I'm a very big advocate for um, cannabis for seniors. Um, I, the very first article that I wrote in the very first Senzi was a, about that particular subject. And I still believe that seniors can be the biggest beneficiaries of cannabis. There's a lot of um, a lot of history, a lot of baggage. I can understand why somebody who has uh, who's my age, for instance, who might say, you know, it's been illegal this long. There's, there's got to be something wrong there. I can understand that. But the fact is we're coming up with ways now. There are pills, there are tinctures, there are sublinguals. There are all kinds of ways to use cannabis that you don't have to smoke it. And there's all kinds of things that CBD, even though we haven't done all of the research, are showing a lot of promise for. I mean, we use CBD for our dog, and it helps with her anxiety. You know. What can you say? I can't say for sure that that's absolutely it because there hasn't been that much research done, but obviously something's going on. You know, cannabis has been used as a healing plant for thousands of years, even though we don't really know. And so I think that those possibilities are the things that are going to keep us going and that seniors definitely are going to be the beneficiaries of this as soon as we can break down that kind of stigma and those kind of barriers. At my age and at this point in my career, I've had a lot of fun. I've had a, done a lot of in, in, interesting things, but this is the most interesting thing I've ever been involved with. I just, uh, you know, every day is something new, you know, something new is happening, and uh, there's so much to learn. And being able to work around people who are half my age, most of the people who are involved in the industry, is kind of a blessing for me. Uh, people say, you know, you're more seasoned, you're kind of a mentor, but I think it might work the other way around. I think that I might be getting more out of it than anybody else. I've never in my life once ever uh, planned anything out for what I was going to do. You know, I just sort of came upon journalism when I was 27 years old and it was, whoa, that's the right thing. And I think that my advice is just, Keep open, 
to almost everything. You never know when that possibility is going to happen. Um, I had tried a lot of other things, and it wasn't really till I hit journalism that it was like, yeah, this is something I could really do. And so keep yourself open to almost anything. You never know when that possibility or that chance might come and when you have to take advantage of it or not. These people outside, they must be high or something. They keep acting crazy, but I guess it's okay since marijuana and getting high is legal now, right? I remember my mother thinking out loud as she looked outside from our kitchen window. Hey mom, what does it mean to get high? I asked. Out of everything she said, the phrase marijuana promotes crime because people cannot think right is what I clearly remember because it was then that I understood that I was not to ever get near this crazy drug. Only bad people use marijuana. I heard from friends, family, and teachers around me. As time went by, more and more people I knew, including close friends, began to use marijuana. This meant that my best friend and others were off limits to hang out with, according to my mom. What's the big deal? Why do my friends and others consume weed if it's so bad? I began to research online and started asking lots of more questions. Does marijuana have any medical benefits? What are marijuana's negative health effects? How is marijuana different from alcohol and crack? As I began educating myself about cannabis, my mom said, ¿Por qué quieres aprender de eso? ¿Acaso tú usas? ¿Quieres destruir tu vida? Why all the accusations? All I want to do is educate myself on this drug that many people say it's harmful, but at the same time many others rely on to heal themselves. It is not like I'm doing anything wrong. Have you not taught me to educate myself on drugs and their effects? No one is hesitant to teach us about alcohol and crack, so what is so wrong with weed? I remember arguing. Cannabis as a medicine took on a new meaning for me during my sophomore year in high school. My friends suffer from seizures, and no one but I knew it. Move everything around him so that he does not get hurt, and let's turn him on his side. I remember telling everyone while I held his head and passed my hand through his hair. Years later, I heard he tried cannabis for his condition. Until this day, he will tell you that it has been life-changing. The problem with cannabis as a medicine is that more research is needed because of a history of research focused on the negative effects of cannabis. I am hopeful that more studies are being done to fully understand the positive effects of cannabis and offer arguments against cannabis as a devil's drug. With all this new information I have acquired through the past few years, I am a more informed potential consumer and positioned to have a more informed conversation about cannabis with my mom and others who oppose cannabis. In fact, it was not that long ago that my mother and I had a conversation on explaining to young children what cannabis is and discussed why that is an important conversation to have. A lot more kids nowadays see their parents use cannabis, whether it is for recreational or medical purposes. It is important that kids begin to understand that their parents using cannabis is not necessarily a bad thing but that they do need to treat it as another thing that they are not allowed to touch or play with. We need to open the conversation because that is how we avoid accidents, I said. It made me feel good when she heard me out and calmly replied, I do not encourage anyone to consume it, but I do see your point. It was at that moment that I understood that that particular response might have just been the first step in the right direction. I served in the United States Army from October 2010 to May 2014. It is one of the hardest jobs a person will have to do. I was a 91 Alpha, an Abrams Systems Maintainer, a tank mechanic. The blank check I signed to the United States government loomed over my head. I did not see combat, but I did experience some harsh environments and bad and good leadership. This as well as poor decision making and a poor 
marriage contributed to my team chief and a mental health professional listing me as having non-combat induced PTSD. I include myself in the number of service members and civilians who've suffered trauma in some way or form, such as car accidents, domestic violence incidents, and sexual assaults. These experiences may induce post-traumatic stress disorder in a person, causing the individual to seek help. The cure or road to recovery usually takes form of psychological help, prescribed medicines, and antidepressants. However, the synthetic drugs tend to suppress a person's mental trauma. It is understood that the antidepressants are a band-aid. For some, speaking to a professional therapist may help, though it runs the risk of re-traumatizing people. Sometimes the mix of opioids and therapy does not help at all, and it forces change in a person. Anger, depression, seclusion, and ability to connect with people are some of the things that can aggravate PTSD symptoms. My symptoms are anger, distrust, seclusion, and the inability to reconnect with people outside my close personal circle of friends. While my symptoms are not derived from PTSD caused by combat or loss of limb or traumatic injury, they still influence my day-to-day mental wellness. To me, the military means family, and I have been touched by the various service members who took their own lives due to PTSD. I myself was almost among the 22. This was the number of veterans, according to the VA in 2013, who committed suicide per day. A couple of years back, while I was active duty, and after being pushed to the brink to a broken marriage and job-related stress, I thought about taking my own life with a borrowed 22 caliber rifle. Now that when I look back on these personal problems, they're trivial. They clearly left an imprint on my personal identity, though. Many veterans and I believe that the Department of Veteran Affairs is not doing enough to properly take care of us when we exit the military. This needs to change. Part of the change may, the, may be the availability of low-cost or free medical cannabis. I'm not a user of marijuana, medical or recreational, but I do know many people, friends, roommates, and fellow veterans who've consumed cannabis to help with chronic pain, anxiety, and the emotional turmoil. It seems perfectly reasonable to ensure individuals in need should have options, especially natural and non-addictive ones. Nick Edden, a former Navy, Navy SEAL and a founder of the Veterans Cannabis Project, agrees with me. He educates people on how marijuana is helpful medicine for veterans and how it is more effective than the pills the VA prescribes. In 2018, the VA says it wants to help study how marijuana can alleviate PTSD among veterans. Since marijuana is a Schedule I drug and is illegal in the eyes of the federal government, the VA is unable to officially conduct cannabis PTSD studies. This obstacle does not stop veterans from using medical, medical cannabis, though vets consuming it understand that they are at risk at losing their military disability benefits. I am a soldier, a student, and a citizen. I stand with vets and others who desire cannabis to address problems with PTSD.